Hi, my name is Mike Aben, and welcome to episode 24 of my KSP campaign. In the last episode, we successfully returned the Kerpalo 1 from its flyby of the moon, and I thought, well, why not just upgrade it, get Kerpalo 2 going with some of the more recent parts that I have unlocked, and, uh, and get that going, get that all set up for a mission to f do a flyby of Minmus to finish off that tourist contract that I have. And uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time with this, but I want to show you one mod called Tweak Scale. Um, I've got these great 1.875 meter nose cones that I really, really like. They come from homegrown rockets, but they only come in this 1.875 size, and I want them to fit on these 1.25 meter parts. So I got this mod, it's called Tweak Scale, and what it allows you to do is to adjust the scale of parts. So now I can put these parts onto these particular liquid boosters. Um, really, really neat part, a really, really neat mod. I myself am a little cautious with it, I have it installed because I have Infernal Robotics installed, and Infernal Robotics has Tweak Scale as a dependency, uh, which makes perfect sense on their part. Once you start seeing the Infernal Robotics parts, you'll know exactly why Tweak Scale is, is a very useful thing to keep your part count down. But uh, what I what I need, what I'm cautious with it about, though, is that you know part of the thing about working with a tech tree is being forced into limitations and if you could simply scale up all your parts so you can build rockets as big as you want them to be well, that kind of defeats the whole purpose of having a tech tree in the first place in my opinion because as you tweak the parts the fuel and the thrust and the mass and everything else tweaks up and down proportionally as well so uh, I've disabled tweak scale on all of the stock parts and I'll only use it on parts that don't have different size equivalencies. So for instance, these nose cones, there is no equivalent nose cone in another size. So I feel like, okay, I'm going to use tweak scale for that. We'll come back to the Kerpalo 2 and its improvements on launch day in a future episode. But right now I'd like to go to Svetlana in the Otter 2, uh, doing one of these uh, crew report above certain altitude type of missions. But what I want people to take note of are a couple of things that, uh, are going on to the left of the plane you'll see a waypoint icon sort of down there on the ground indicating which way I should go and in fact if you take a look uh, above or just below the uh, data provide the stock data from KSP you'll see that I have some additional information I'm going to Jophilia's Courage the distance is just under 600 kilometers away it's estimating my time of arrival at about 36 minutes and 30 seconds, and I should be flying at a heading of 351.5 degrees. All of that is being provided by a mod called Waypoint Manager. This is a great mod, a very light little mod, but if you like doing these uh, contracts and find going to the nav ball to try to figure out which way you're going, if you find that all kind of frustrating, this is a great mod for you. So we are now under the one minute mark to our destination. Um, by the way, you can see a lot of those uh, contract requirements have already gone green. You might recall that this mission was actually started a couple of episodes ago with Jebediah in the Otter 1 grabbing a bunch of EVAs on the surface. And now the Otter 2 is picking up these high altitude ones. So we're closing in on our destination. We have to get ready to do our crew report. There we go, do our crew report. And of course, no science associated with that, but it finishes off the contract. And now comes my favorite part. I, I open up this window and I can select my next destination from here. No going to the map view, there it is. That is just awesome. I have to adjust my heading now to 330 degrees. So we'll go ahead and do that. And uh, yeah, and that one's only about 10 minutes away, a little under 11 minutes really, and this one I have to do uh, above 19.5 uh, kilometers, and uh, yeah, that's going to require, if you recall, the rocket engine of this thing. That's why this has got that rocket engine on the back. I've used it a few times, so you've seen it before. 
I don't know about you guys, but any mod that uh, allows me not to have to go into map view is always a great mod to have, because map view always sort of takes me out and... Oh, what the heck? I got a coolant leak in my starboard engine. Well, oh man, I'm only two and a half minutes away from my destination. I, I, no, I, I guess that's probably going to result in it overheating, but I'm going to gamble that the overheating won't happen too quickly. I'll keep an eye on it. But, uh, yeah, I, I'm only a couple of minutes from my destination. I, I, I need my speed. So, uh, sorry, uh, dang it. I'm going to have to ignore you on this one for a little while. Okay, so uh, about a minute and 20 seconds away from our destination. Still no overheating issues. Uh, so that's a good thing. So I'm keeping my throttle at full until at least this mission or this contract is done because I do need... Oh, we're here. We're here. So pitch up. Fire that engine! Let's go, let's go, let's go! So the idea here is to pitch it straight up because I don't want to end up leaving this destination. I'm watching my... Oh, I don't have... Ah, Kerbal Engineer, I need need you! <laughs> I've got to get the orbital stuff! Why am I in trouble? Here we go! Okay, i got to watch my apoapsis. I need to get over 19 and a half kilometers. There we go, 20 kilometers, 20 and a half kilometers. Okay, I'm going to clear that even with air resistance. Let's turn that off. So, we'll just coast up. When our altitude reaches 19.5 kilometers, we will do our crew report. I'm going to keep an eye on science, too. I don't know if there is any science up here for me to get. Oh, science alert mods just come on in my high altitude state. Let's get that crew report done first. I don't want to end up messing up. Ah! Oh, okay. Here we go. Crew report. That's done. Let's check out science materials bay. Oh, I guess there's probably a smidge of material stuff. Yeah, sure, grab that. Uh, and some goo too. Okay, okay, now we gotta get ourselves back down. Oh, we are falling. I'm falling in a backwards direction. That's not a good way to fly a plane. <laughs> Close the camera again. You know, I love the chase camera. I really, really do, but it, it does have its issues. It gets a little wonky at certain situations. It gets wonky when you go from suborbital to orbital, and it gets very wonky, obviously, when you are go when you have your uh, direction going straight up or straight down. Or <laughs> there we go. Okay, come on, we gotta pitch up. We're gonna fly straight down into the ground here. Pitch up, pitch up, pitch up, pitch up. Okay. Okay, uh, I think we're all right. We be fine. Okay, we can start firing up these engines again. You notice probably if the engines flamed out, but it's not an issue. As soon as I get myself back down to a reasonable altitude and there's some enough oxygen around to, to keep those engines going, then everything is fine. And yeah, one thing I did here is didn't notice that I would still have my rocket engine going. Uh, I don't notice this for a little while, um, <laughs> which is really, really dumb, because I'm just I'm just burning fuel now. I don't need the rocket engine anymore. I should be shutting it down. Yeah, let's put on those temperature gauges. And the one I'm really concerned with is the engine, of course, because it's leaking, co leaking coolant, but I can still see that it is. A, I think it's in the green still. It's not even in the yellow yet, so engine's fine and I'll just fly home at half throttle. I mean, it'll take me a little bit longer, but should be all right. And I'll look here at the ScanSat map with raster prop monitor to try and get my heading back to KSC. Looks like, oh, what's that? South by southeast, I'll go with that. So south, a little bit to the east, probably split the difference between the 180 and 135. It'll be really nice I'm just checking Waypoint Manager. There's, yeah, it'd be really nice if you could select Kerbal Space Center on this Waypoint Manager, and it could put a waypoint up for that and give you a heading and a time to destination and a distance. That would be really cool, but it's not there. Anyway, here I finally noticed that I still have my rocket engine going. Um, to be honest, I, I don't think it was that bad. I noticed that it, it did uh, flame out very shortly after throttling up again probably because it completely ran out of oxidizer and I'm assuming once it's running out of oxid once it's run out of oxidizer it's hopefully no longer spitting fuel out the back uh, that would be a bit of a problem but low fuel didn't turn out to be a problem nor did 
all the temperature gauges that you're seeing here the uh, again the temperature on the engine always stayed in the green I monitored it the whole way same with the circuiter intake I guess the uh, failing coolant also affects that but uh, either way everything was operating nominally nonetheless and despite the failing light and having to land after sunset no issues getting Svetlana back home and finishing off this particular mission and that brings us to JunkSat 2, which has got to do one of these satellite insertion type missions. It's got this big orbit to go into about the same altitude as the moon is, but its inclination is only 6.1 degrees, which is far better than what JunkSat 1 had to do a number of episodes ago and go into this big retrograde orbit, which was really, really expensive. But even with this small inclination, you know, do yourself the favor, launch yourself into the inclination. Don't make the inclination change out in space it costs fuel much more fuel to do it that way instead you know launch into the inclination by looking at your target over it lining up the ascending and descending nodes time warping until the Kerbal Space Center is underneath one of those nodes take note of whether you have to launch towards the north or towards the south in my case here I have to launch towards the north because remember we are going from west to east which is left to right on this particular screen so we're going north in it going that way um and so um that means that my heading has to be north 6.1 degrees now normally my heading is 90 degrees north is smaller heading number so i subtract 6.1 degrees so that gives me a heading of let's see here i can do it uh, 83.9 degrees and uh so i'm going to launch straight into that heading so i do want an eventual heading about 84 degrees but uh, here once I start my gravity turn I want you to take a look at the heading that I do have well not me doing it obviously my KOS script doing it but notice that my heading is now what 83 degrees right it's a little bit north of the actual heading that I do eventually want to have. You don't want to aim straight at your heading. You want to stay a little bit north of it because remember that you're already moving in an eastward direction um, because that's the way Kerbin is rotating. So you always want to sort of aim, you know, you, you think about that you're pulling that inclination towards you. So now my heading's now 82 degrees, even a little bit further because KOS is sort of paying attention to its heading and it's adjusting it accordingly. Uh, one of the things is I do have some new parts here and the thing that I really like, uh, I got finally the 1.25 meter reaction wheels. You can barely see them in there and that means I don't need the big tail fins anymore. So I've gone down to these little tail fins. I don't need tail fins with uh, control surfaces on them or anything like that. There weren't any tail fins on the boosters. You might have noticed that as well. So, you know, the reaction wheels in uh, Kerbal Space Program are so strong that um, you know, you, you really kind of don't need anything else once you have those in place, as long as you don't stray too far from your prograde vector, which you shouldn't be anyways when you're in the atmosphere. So we'll just cut to a point uh, quite a bit higher in our ascent. You can see we've already had main, jet, main engine cut off, we've lost the fairings, and we're just coasting up to our apoapsis and getting ready to perform our circularization when all of a sudden I notice, oh shoot, I need to have a mystery goo unit on this satellite, which I don't have. I missed that requirement. Okay, plan B. Plan B. Plan B is this. Okay, so this is not going to be able to do that orbital ins or satellite insertion one. But what I do have is I do have a remote tech contract somewhere in here to set up a communication network around the moon. There it is, create a network for the moon. And what I need to do is I need to get communication coverage around the moon, at least 95% communication coverage and have it last for up to seven days. And uh, sorry, so JunkSat2, you are now going to be a communication satellite. So my new destination is going to be the moon. Now, thankfully the Delta V requirements for that satellite insertion mission were higher than what it would take to uh, put a satellite in orbit around the moon. So I have plenty of fuel to spare, but one thing I do have to fix is I do have to fix my inclination. So you can see here that while I'm doing my circularization, I'm also burning quite a bit towards the south 
um, trying to pull that inclination down. Thankfully, that inclination was only six degrees. Uh, it would have been much more interesting if that inclination were higher than that. But anyway, uh, it still ended up with something that I did need to fix. I wanted to get my inclination right down to zero before I did my transfer out to the moon. Thankfully, the information coming from Kerbal Engineer makes all of that pretty easy. You can see here that I still have an inclination of 3.6 degrees. So what I am doing is I am time warping to the equatorial descending node, which is about three minutes away. I could do it at either of the nodes, but uh, that's the one that's coming up first. Now, since this is a descending node, uh, I am going to have to burn in a northward direction in order to bring my inclination down. You always want to do these inclination changes at the nodes. Um, you can do this through map view, setting up a maneuver and all that kind of stuff, but heck, you know, I like doing stuff uh, without having to go to map view, so this works pretty good. So, just about at the equatorial descending node, we start our burn, and I'm just watching that inclination come down. And, uh, Let's see, 1.7, we can keep going down, keep going down. It's one degree. I get as low as I can. Zero, zero 0.05, that's good, yes. 1.05 degrees. More than happy with that. And now it's time for us to do our transfer out to the moon, which of course you've seen me do a number of times before. But uh, I am doing something a little bit different here. And that's because I'm not interested in getting myself really close to the moon like I have had to in the past. What I'm interested in is getting myself to, I want my periapsis with the moon to be 1,255 kilometers. And uh, that's a very specific number I know because I'm aiming to put it into a circular equatorial orbit with an altitude of about 1,255 kilometers because that will give me a period work this out to be two hours and I hate the way this I don't know why it's still it's doing this I find this really annoying where it can't seem to decide whether I have an encounter or not and I really can't see my periapsis oh there we go that's it 1255 kilometers that gives me an orbital period of two hours because I'm going to make this is going to be the first of a communication network eventually there's going to be uh, three satellites in this particular communication network but they need to stay you know, they're all going to be in the same orbit, but they need to stay in the same orientation relative to each other. And the easiest way to do that is to give them the same, well, the only way to do that is give them the same period. And the easiest way to give them the same period is make it a period that's easy to remember. So I made the period two hours. That's a nice, easy number to remember. By the way, uh, I already got a plan for what the other two satellites are going to be. I'm going to have to launch another one to do the, uh, I guess it'll be a JunkSat 3, which this time will have a mystery goo container to do that satellite insertion mission. And I'm going to give it some extra delta V so that it will have enough delta V to get it over to the moon. So it'll do some, it'll do double duty. I've always noticed with these remote tech contracts, it doesn't care if they're new satellites or not. So I'm going to take advantage of that. And I'm planning on making the third communication satellite, ComSat-1, which was a botched orbital insertion from way back ago on my first attempt at uh, putting up a communication satellite and it ran out of fuel. And uh, I do have a, an idea to get up there once I have the appropriate parts and fuel it up and then get it over here. So I should be able to build this communication network uh, pretty cheaply. And so here we are in the moon's sphere of influence, and I'm just going to use a maneuver node just to see what the cost of this circularization is going to be. I know there's delta V maps out there that tell you what it is to get an orbit around the moon, but those are always set up for um, getting a low uh, orbit around whatever body that you're interested in. And uh, it can sometimes catch people off guard. I know it caught me off guard the first time it hap uh, I ran into it, is that if you are doing your circularization higher up, it gets more expensive. You can see here, this is about a 390 meter per second burn, but at low lunar orbit, it's actually quite a bit, it's, it's around 310, so that's pretty cheap. So I'm gonna use the um, maneuver node button to warp to it. So I'm warping to periapsis, I'm gonna do my burn. Oh my shoot, oh, okay, it's giving me no lead time into periapsis. 
I only got 10 seconds to periapsis. I got to do my burn. Get get yourself burn, pointed retrograde. <laughs> Shoot, I got to... Oh, man, I need to use alarm clock, not use this. Anyway, there we go. Burn. Come on. There we are. Okay, burning, 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 and we need to circularize. So I'm burning a little bit late. I'm trying to correct for it by aiming downwards just a little bit. And I do want to make sure I don't overburn it too. I want to get my apoapsis down to around 1,255 kilometers. I also have to watch my period and bring my orbital period down to two hours. So yeah, it's looking okay despite the bit of a panicky start. Okay, bringing that down now. Might be noticing I already got 75% coverage of the moon. You're wondering how on earth you're getting 75% coverage with just a single satellite. Well, actually what's happening is, is I do have dish antennas from Kerbin, from those communication satellites around Kerbin, uh, pointed at the moon. So that already has 50% of the moon covered. So uh, this is, I guess, adding on another 25%. So that's what's happening there. Oh, I overcooked it. My orbital period is too low. So I'll bring it back up. Did I say I wanted an orbital period of two hours? I'm a melon head. I sh I, if I said that, I'm sorry. I meant an orbital period of two days. That's two Kerbin days, of course, which is 12 hours. There, I overcooked it the other way. Oh, I'm doing great here. <laughs> Thankfully, fuel is not an issue. All right, let's get ourselves pointed retrograde once again. And why not try tweaking down that engine? There we go. Right down even further. Yeah, five points. Let's see. Okay. I'm going to do just little puffs. So 12 hours and 40, 20 seconds, 10 seconds. Well, there, there, it's kind of bouncing around the 12 hour mark now. So that's as close as I'm going to get. That's pretty good. I'm looking, it's not, my eccentricity is a little bit crappy, I think. I mean, my, my apoapsis is around 1260 kilometers and my periapsis is around 1250 kilometers. I can do better than that. And, and the way you do better than that, I can fix it now because actually my altitude is 1255 kilometers. So I can fix it right here. All I have to do is point myself radially inwards. If I point, if I burn radially inwards, what I'll end up doing is pulling my apoapsis towards me, which will reduce it, while at the same time pushing my periapsis away, which will increase it. And uh, yeah, so I'm going to do a little radial burn just to try and make this a little bit more circular. So there we go. We got ourselves onto the radial vector. And we'll start throttling up a little bit. And oh, my apoapsis is going up. What am I doing? Right again. Still going up. Well, oh, for goodness sakes, I'm, I'm pushing radially outwards. The blue part of the nav ball is up. The orange part's down. What a ding-dong. <laughs> you would think, God knows how many hours of Kerbal Space Program I'd used to, orange is down. There's our radial in vector. By the way, just looking at the icons, you see the little radial lines in that purple circle? They're going in? That means that one's the radially in, right? Going towards the center of the circle. And then the other one, the lines are out. Okay, so that's bringing down my apoapsis, bringing up my periapsis. If you notice, I'm not really affecting my period at all as I do this. If you do a pure radial burn, the amount of actual energy in the burn is staying pretty much the same. You're just affecting the apoapsis and periapsis without mucking with everything else. And there we go. That's nice. That's really, really close to circular. Perfect. All right, so I, I, I'm probably going to come back and tweak this orbit a little bit more in the future. But for now, that is more than happy enough. So there we go. There is my first of hopefully three communication satellites to go around the moon. and uh, But the other two are going to have to be for future episodes because this is going to be ending this episode. I thank you for watching, and I hope to see you next time.